to see that over the past couple decades, it's been the policies adopted by both Republican and Democratic administrations that have undermined the rights of unions to unionize and made it harder for workers to form and keep unions. And there are many things that can be done. Uh, recently, the Obama administration approved the uh, Federal Aviation uh, Administration, the FAA reauthorization, which made it further uh, difficult for unions in transportation industries to be formed. Uh, likewise, the Obama administration, or I should say the, the president, abandoned his promise as a candidate to support the Employee Free Choice Act, which would make it much easier to form unions. And under my administration, that will again be a high priority. We also need to go back to the so-called free trade agreements, uh, which, you know, signed under Clinton and extended just uh, in the recent weeks by President Obama, who then uh, extended the free trade agreement to Colombia, a union-destroying country, which creates an even greater race to the bottom between American workers uh, and, and workers overseas. So, you know, I think above all, we need people in the White House uh, as well as in all levels of government who are committed to working people and who will uphold and increase the minimum wage and the sub-minimum wage for tipped workers who are, who are treated as subhuman, I guess, for getting a sub-minimum wage, uh, and uh, to renegotiate the free trade agreement, agreement so that they are fair trade agreements, uh, not free. <laughs> tax system. There are so many articles out about corporations that don't pay taxes at the national and local levels. Jill. You know, I, I think we need to go back to the drawing boards on, on the whole tax system and start to make it fair and equitable, uh, including in cor corporate taxes so that, you know, we need to maintain the corporate tax rate, not lower it like Barack Obama is advocating, uh, along with the Republicans. We also need to co to close corporate loopholes, we need to tax corporate ta corporate shelters overseas as well because there are hundreds of billions of dollars for yeah. tax in these uh, corporate tax havens. But in addition, we need to start taxing capital gains like income. That's where the, that's where the money really is. And while uh, the president's Buffett rule, you know, a minimum tax on millionaires, is a good idea, that is just scraping the surface of what needs to be done. So we need a truly graduated income tax that increases at higher levels of income in many steps, and particularly to start taxing capital gains. Um, and also, we need to start taxing Wall Street transactions. <laughs> one other thing about student debt, what's really uh, disturbing, I mean, in, in addition to it being a trillion dollars more than credit card debt, as you mentioned, you know, students are essentially subsidizing through high tuitions tax breaks for millionaires and billionaires, which have been protected while students have absorbed these incredible cuts, almost a billion dollars in cuts since 2008 in California to the public higher education system. And while students are getting hit now, it's been a 300% increase in tuition for students over the last, since 02, I think, in this state. At the same time, we're seeing uh, salaries for the uh, executives, for the CEOs of the universities, go up and up and up to the $250 and $350 range. And those salaries are being increased as the students are receiving uh, t tuition hikes. So this is absolutely unacceptable. Yeah. You both believe in bringing the troops home and shutting down military bases around the globe, right? Okay. Yeah. So according to this website, this is an incredible website you should all check out. It's called militaryindustrialcomplex.com. <laughs> And according to this site, they track all the contracts that are handed out on a daily basis. And it's amazing to, to, to look at this with absolutely no scrutiny. 46 publicly reported contracts were handed out last week for a total of almost $3 billion. This is one week. And yet this rarely gets covered. Almost $202 million on Friday and almost $852 million on Thursday. 
And they do parse it out, so they'll say Lockheed Martin, Boeing. Uh, it's just fascinating to look at. So, since you're both on the same page about that, what role do you think the U.S. military should play in the United States and abroad? The guiding force in our foreign policy needs to shift from the flexing of military muscles and the securing of uh, energy and other resources instead to uh, the upholding of international law and human rights, which should be uh, the guiding force in our foreign policy across the board. And it's not only uh, that we're spending an enormous amount of money in the military, but increasingly it's the military industrial security complex. And military is becoming securitized, and our domestic uh, police forces are becoming militarized. So we need to start shifting the money from this military industrial security complex to domestic uses. During the Second World War, we transformed car factories into bomber factories. It's time to transform the bomber factories into wind tower, solar, and solar factories. There, there's so much going on, we would need five hours to really talk about what's happening, but well, how about an open-ended question to both of you? What concerns you most about U.S. foreign policy, and what would you, what would you like to change? What's at the top of your list, Jill? I guess, you know, I'd like to change the whole ball of wax, and, and instead of having over a thousand bases in over 140 countries around the world, we need to bring those men and women home and the war dollars home and use them here uh, and stop being, I think it's not really the policeman of the world, it's sort of the exploiter of the world, yeah. the guys of the world. Belcher is going to come up in just a minute to ask about a healthcare question. But first, let's talk about the environment. Uh, James Hansen, director of NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies, had a damning piece in Thursday's New York Times called Game Over for the Climate. He writes, President Obama speaks of a planet in peril, but he does not provide the leadership needed to change the world's course. Our leaders must speak candidly to the public, which yearns for open, honest discussion. The science of the situation is clear. We cannot wait any longer to avoid the worst and be judged immoral by coming generations. So, again, a big question, but how would you deal with climate change and what we're dealing with? I mean, if we keep eating the fish that we're eating, by the year 2050, no more fish in the ocean. That's just one uh, example. So, when it comes to the environment and climate change, what is at the top of your list? I, I want to add to uh, what, what Roseanne just said and also to uh, Jim Hansen's criticism of the president. He, he's not only, you know, not walking the walk, and, and he is to some degree talking the talk, but he is not only not walking the walk, well actually he's walking the walk in the wrong direction, that's what he's doing. <laughs> And he's basically become the drill baby drill president who has essentially embraced the bad positions of the of the Bush administration and then gone much further. Not only uh, not only what he's doing on nuclear power in terms of the environment in general, but also you know more mountaintop removal, opening up more off offshore oil drilling as well as uh, wilderness areas for fossil fuel exploration. Uh, and giving the green light to fracking and so on. So what this president is doing is exactly the wrong thing. He also sabotaged the climate accord. So it was not only what he has failed to do himself, but that he has actually undermined uh, the international agreements, which are absolutely essential. And this is why when people say, you know, oh, I'm afraid of voting my values and, and voting green in this next election, it's really important to wake them up yes. that uh, Supreme Court, you know, isn't going to make the difference here, that the climate clock is ticking, and we need to not just vote with our feet, we also need to vote with our vote to live green and vote green starting now. And on day one of my administration, if I were honored to serve, I would, one, clean house, clean house in the White House and get out Michael Taylor and the likes of Monsanto uh, and Tom Vilsack, who have enormous uh, influence in high places. We would deny the Keystone Pipeline on day one. And instead, we would create 
create hundreds of thousands, if not millions of jobs the next day by undertaking a weatherization program of every home, school, business, and public building in the country. And we would instruct the USDA to start prioritizing sustainable local agriculture, family farms, and community-supported agriculture, not only business, we would also instruct the EPA to start actually protecting the environment yeah. and human health. And that means saying no to fracking, to the expansion of fossil fuels, no to any more mountaintop removal. And that's it for Scarlett. <laughs> stepping forward as spokespeople for the 99%. Thank you very much. My question is about Medicare for All or single-payer health care. I, I assume you both support this, um, and the Green Party is part of their platform. But the, the tough part of winning Medicare for All in this country is not in a, in a room like this or on a campus winning the debate. The tough part is getting a hold of the microphone to win more of the American public over this. Uh, position to get the insurance companies out of health care and to have a great health care program for everybody, like the other, all the other industrialized nations. So how will you use, my question is, how will you use your campaign to win more millions of people over to the position that we need a national health care system minus the insurance companies or it's Medicare for all or single payer in those terms? How will you use your campaign to get out those millions of people? That actually polls, in fact, show that the American public already supports single-payer Medicare for all by large majority. And if, in fact, we had a democracy, we would have Medicare for all right now. So, I, you know, I think the name of the game is how we get this is by removing the um, the politicians who are standing in the way. That's right. Is how we get Medicare for all. I, I myself got into this as a medical doctor uh, by training and by profession for many years and people ask me what kind of medicine are you practicing now? I say political medicine because it's the mother of all illnesses. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it needs to be fixed in order to fix all those other things that are broken and pathological. And I realized in my own development, you know, as, as an advocate, the healthcare system was broken. I thought you could just go talk to your legislator and maybe they might listen. But, you know, I learned they listen if you come with cash in hand, basically, and that we actually had to reform the political system. And that's what a political party is all about. It's about getting to critical mass so that we can actually do that. And in terms of, like, what are we going to do in the campaign, in my view, the campaign is all about informing and empowering those 50 million people who don't have health care, the 30 million students who are basically indentured servants and swamped in debt, the 18 million homeowners who've either been thrown out already or are underwater and at risk. It's about us all getting together and realizing that together we are a force which is unstoppable and we can move forward right now by standing up and insisting like the people in Tahrir Square did, uh, hold on to your hat and don't, don't undersell yourself for what we can accomplish in this, in this election. Sure you write them on a card and we will be picking them up. I want to ask you both about the war on women. Um, according to the, the Guttmacher Institute, in the first three months of this year, 45 legislatures around the country introduced 944 bills related to reproductive health and reproductive rights. Half of these provisions would restrict abortion access. So far, 75 abortion restrictions have been approved by at least one legislative chamber. Nine have been enacted. We're seeing uh, requirements that would make women seeking an abortion to undergo an ultrasound, limiting access to medication, and prohibiting abortion at a specific point in gestation. 
Uh, it's been fascinating to watch the Democrats really not respond to this, other than to say how horrible the Republicans are for introducing these bills. So what is your response to the onslaught of anti-choice legislation? And how do you, well, how would you kind of bring the women's movement together? Because it is so closely tied to the Democratic Party. Joe. Yes, and I mean, in fact, traditionally it has been, which is why this new grassroots organization that's emerged basically uh, through Facebook called Women Unite Against Women is really uh, a very exciting development, and it's as if the women's movement has just woken up again. Um, I was actually at a demonstration in um, uh, Columbia, South Carolina about two weeks ago uh, that was held by Women Unite Against the War Against Women. And, you know, in the past, I've run for office many times, and it used to be if you showed up for a rally, it was, oh, thank you for coming, but we can't have you speak because that would be partisan. But in this race, it's like, you know, the, the rebellion is in full swing now, and including out there in the women's movement. And in that event, like just about every other event I've been to in the last several months, it's not just come to the, our rally, but it's like headline our rally and tell it like it is and let the American people know that they don't have to put up with this, that we actually have choices. So it was really, um, uh, wonderful to me to see that this national network of women is emerging and that they were really happy to have a green there standing up and saying what we need to do for women's health and for women's economic security. Um, and that this, uh, this sellout that the Democrats and Obama have done pretending that it's a choice between religion and, uh, and, and reproductive health is outrageous because what they basically did was yield, concede on the principle and say that religion trumped, trumped women's health. But in fact, it was the religion of the employer trumping the religion of the employee. It was your boss, your boss's religion telling you, maybe your religion as an employee was that you need to take good care of your family and not have more children than you can take care of. So this was a real conflating of uh, workers' rights and women's right to health care and, and to full reproductive rights with uh, labor justice issues. And we would stand up on that and not yield. And we wouldn't take Plan B off the shelf like President Obama also did in yielding to the religious right as well. And the real solution here is to have a Medicare for all system that doesn't separate out your reproductive health from the rest of you. We come as a package and we need to be cared for. In our entire we have a right to health care. We need to resurrect the Equal Rights Amendment Absolutely. to be sure yeah. that women have equal pay, equal work, so that we put an end to this incredible disparity in poverty where the poverty rate among women is twice that uh, among the general population. 40% of single mothers are in poverty and women are getting 77 cents on the dollar that man is earning. So we need to make that history and uh, get the ER uh, Equal Rights Amendment passed. This forum is being broadcast online and I know that a lot of people are watching because I checked in even at 2 o'clock and there were 30 people online just looking at the marquee outside. So I, I'd like you to speak, before I get to the cards, I, I'd like you to speak directly to the marginalized and ignored communities in this country. I'm glad you mentioned the word poverty, Jill. In the 20, uh, 2008 election, through all the debates, the word poverty wasn't even brought up by John McCain and Barack Obama. Uh, to spe specifically speak to the poor, people with disabilities and the homeless, um, tomorrow's Mother's Day, and I just don't want us to forget about all the homeless moms and the homeless families because there are so many and they really don't have a voice in this country. The latest census data shows that about one in two Americans, this is really hard to believe, they're either poor or low income. That's almost half of the country. Um, again, the Democrats and the Republicans, I'm sure we'll talk about middle class, middle class, middle class, even though the middle class are now falling into poverty. So what would you say to people who are struggling and really hanging on by a thread? When they say that there's no money for the homeless, for the impoverished, for the disabled, for our students who are up to their eyeballs in debt. When they say there's no money, what they really mean is there's no money for you because there's trillions of dollars that are being squandered every year in wars, 
Wall Street bailouts and tax breaks for the wealthy. So in this election, we want you to know that there is money for you, and let's get together and make sure that it is redistributed back to you because it has been stolen from you. question from an audience member, Jessica Jones, do you want to come up to the stage? Jessica is the student president of Santa Rosa Junior College and founder and president of Students for Sustainable Communities. Thank you. So my question revolves around the Kyoto Protocol, which expires this year. And I'd like to throw up, how do we unite and bring international actors together to address climate change? What's the next step once the Kyoto expires? Yeah, I mean, I think it's time to call, uh, to reconvene the Durban Climate Conference that this president disrupted uh, last year and basically sent countries back home without having achieved a climate accord. And what they decided was, oh, we'll wait until 2020, but if you're following the science at all, if you're looking out the window and watching the weather at all, you know that we don't have time to wait until 2020. So yeah, I mean, I think we need to reconvene and establish an international accord, and I think we need to lead in the right direction by adopting a real climate strategy for this country. And that means nothing less than a Manhattan Project, a Marshall Plan for emergently greening our economy, uh, creating those 25 million jobs which will essentially accomplish that, and let's start to go carbon neutral ourselves as quickly as possible, hopefully within the next 10 years, and then we have a real moral authority to actually galvanize the rest of the world to do the same. In answer to the first part of your question, how, you know, how will this campaign help grow the Green Party? And I think you said, is the Green Party a national electoral force? And I would say yes, definitely. I mean, it is the one national, non-corporate electoral force out there, which means it is the only real electoral force. And, and it's easy to point out, you know, uh, as I say, the cup is 10% empty or it's 90% full, depending on how you look at it. And yes, the Green Party is a small party. Uh, it is not overflowing in money. Uh, we are people-powered and a, uh, uh, a low-budget operation, but what we do is absolutely incredible. We have not yet missed a single ballot access deadline or threshold. And that is very much thanks to this incredible culture of empowerment that uh, is alive and well in our state chapters all over the country. And what our campaign has been doing is helping those chapters revive, doing, um, you know, helping, helping people get through the trauma, the political trauma of what we've lived through, where we've been fear campaigned and smear campaigned over the past 10 years. And, but compare us to all the other progressive, non-corporate parties out there. We are the only ones that have survived to live and fight another day. And, and at this time, the national need is so uh, staggering. You know, I just thank my lucky stars that people have been there fighting the fight and holding the fort. We've been ahead of the curve for decades, but suddenly the curve has caught up to us with a vengeance uh, and people are ready for what we've been talking about and developing for a long time. So it's an exciting, incredibly exciting opportunity. And if I could just add real quickly uh, about the media and the question of how do we break through on the media. And, um, you know, I think it's great for uh, Roseanne to be able to get on uh, the shows. 
But I would add to that, in addition, that what we have is really not a functioning press. We have an O press and a D press and a D press. And in fact, the alternative to that O press now is basically the press that they used in Tahrir Square and in Tunisia, which is basically the internet and Facebook and social media. That is how we are going to get to critical mass. If you start putting together the millions and millions of people whose lives literally depend on what we are and what we alone are offering, you start getting very quickly up there in numbers. You got to be at 15% in order to get into the big corporate debates. I've debated Mitt Romney before in 2002 and was declared the only adult in the room. <laughs> If they haven't admitted us into the debates, uh, we fully intend to be out in front live streaming the debates in real time and really answering the questions and going viral and ensuring that in this election we, uh, we blow the top off of this repressive political system and actually get the word out about the real democracy that we can be. Another member of the audience, Jella Biafra, who is a former candidate. Nice to meet you. How do you do? Okay. I think my top question that kind of got answered by Jill just now, which was. Uh, should there be a Green Party candidate for president at all when the only momentum this party has is that for local offices where we actually win from time to time? So I guess you've answered that as being... You want to answer more specifically? Yeah, yeah absolutely. And uh, before entering this race, um, I myself was very focused on local politics and on developing the Green Party. The first time I ran for office, I was the best candidate I ever was because all I did was run for office. I didn't know that if you wanted anything to come out of your race, you also had to build a party while you did it. So when that first race was over, I was really glad about how I did, but there wasn't a whole new party to show for it. In every race I ran after that, and there were about five of them, uh, I really ran in order to build the party, and I ran to help develop the locals and the state chapter uh, and to recruit other candidates. And I was running usually headliner campaigns, but what we found was that by running those headliner campaigns, we got the word out about the alternative party that we desperately need, that there is one, and about the solutions that we that we actually deserve and can achieve and are, can afford and are within our reach. And it totally transformed the party and over the course of 10 years, we went from being a very small and rather marginal party to where in our most recent race, we came within 200 votes of actually winning a seat in the Massachusetts legislature and we had all the endorsements of all the progressive groups that usually vote Democratic because we completely changed the public perception of what the party was about. So I realized that if we did that at the state level, we could also do that at the national level and that that clock is ticking, we don't have time to spare, we need to do it now nationally because we can't afford to sit this one out while we plunge over the cliff and do this. Thank you. Tempting though it may be to go into some of my own pet ones, you might know this, whether or not the California Green Party still has on its state platform enacting not just a 90% but a maximum wage. <coughs> I would say, well originally I would say 100 grand, we'll up to 200 grand, you can live pretty good. 
or the bailout money, the stimulus money should have gone straight to the people with the mortgages on the condition they pay it all back to the banks, the banks are <coughs> the anyway. Or that Obama is looking to approve Keystone XL in 2013, <coughs> but even if he doesn't, Canada's going to go full speed ahead with the tar sands and whatnot. Anyway, yeah, let's go to that one, because that relates to this question as well. This is a two-part question. If you were actually elected, how would you deal with a predominantly hostile Congress? And considering everybody from Canada to China is you know, determined to go ahead with tar sands and so much coal dust from Chinese factories, I have to wipe it off the windshield of my car, which is in a garage periodically <laughs> in this town. How do you deal with the big bad world out there once you get outside our green bubble? Basically. Great. First question about how to deal with a hostile Congress, the Green Party, the Green Rainbow Party in Massachusetts has been struggling with that at the state level as well, although we haven't been in positions of power, but even from the outside we have been grappling with, with this. And uh, I have to say that there are some really good strategies out there, and to summarize, what I would say is that the president should not simply be the, quote, commander-in-chief. The president should be the organizer-in-chief and ensure that the public is informed and empowered to be weighing in in real time about the bills that are actually coming up. Because if the public were in charge, we would be passing our entire agenda. Access. The president can go on prime time, you know, TV if the president wants. The president has plenty of access to email and Twitter and uh, web postings and the internet and the press. Hard for the press to lock out the president. The president can be blowing the whistle on the waste, fraud, and abuse in Congress and actually promoting the bills that need to be passed. Uh, the president can basically serve as a moveon.org that moves on from the Democratic Party. <laughs> and start to actually uh, push the agenda that we need. And in terms of dealing with the big bad world out there, you know, I would say same strategies apply. And, you know, it's the same sort of 1% against the 99% all around the world. And if we prevailed as the 99% here, there's just no doubt that we could make the same thing happen all over the globe. Yeah. Yeah. And on that note, a question from the audience, do you support the Occupy movement? And as summer is upon us, the movement is getting ready to really get back into the streets. And I, I think we're going to see major crackdowns because we actually did a show about the militarization of police forces. So how do you think the movement should respond to that? And what is really, in your mind, effective activism, Joe? Yes. Uh, you know, I think that the uh, brutal suppression of the Occupy movement and the violation of our free speech rights, our right to protest, uh, and to uh, demonstrate for redress of grievances you know, is really a threat to not just the Occupy movement, to us all, and we all need to be mobilizing in this race and uh, out in the streets to ensure that we protect our constitutional rights and we not give a pass to this president who has actually been leading the charge against our constitutional rights on in, indefinite detentions, on the assassination of U.S. citizens and their children, for that, for that matter, uh, and the criminalization of protest. Uh, in terms of, of approaching the Occupy movement, I've probably been to 25 Occupy sites, at least I would say, in every state that I've been to, in every, con in every city. I uh, made a point of going to the Occupy movement and not asking for their vote, but telling them that I'm there to support them. And that has invariably created a wonderful conversation and connections and support from individuals who are there. I don't think Occupy has a process um, for endorsing candidates, which is as it should be, because they are certainly 
uh, you know, very much in the target hairs of the corporate political parties, so they do need to be very guarded. But what I find is that when our campaign shows up, they get, and I'm sure this is true for Roseanne as well, they get that we are an entirely different kind of animal, that we are not predatory politics as usual. Throughout the history of social movements, it's always been the collaboration of social movements together with independent electoral parties independent political parties, the Liberty Party during abolition, the Women's Party for the women's uh, right to vote, the Socialist, Labor, and Progressive Parties for the right to unionize and 40-hour work week and safe workplaces. It's always been this collaboration that has made history and small parties help articulate the agenda, uh, the solutions, and put those demands, force and drive those demands into broader public discourse because as Frederick Douglass said, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has, it never will. That is what our party and that is what our campaigns are all about, is moving those demands, those solutions into the public dialogue so that they take on a life of their own and they will be unstoppable. So we remind the Occupy movement, be out there and vote with your feet, but also vote with your vote. Don't raise the white flag of surrender over the voting booth. Right. Okay. Um, one question, can you comment on the war on drugs in the US and Latin America? How will you combat using prisons to hold people without charge? What is your position on capital punishment? Here in California, we are going to vote to overturn the death penalty in November. The war on drugs needs to be uh, called to a screeching halt. The, um, uh, the issue of drug use needs to be treated as a mental health and public health problem, not as a criminal issue. Yeah. And, and in fact, marijuana is a drug which is dangerous because it's illegal. It's not illegal because it's dangerous. And that's a uh, Roseanne said, you legalize marijuana and you pull the rug right out from under the whole criminal enterprise of under, underground drug violence. So, and NAFTA. <laughs> and um, while, we're on, while we're on the subject, along with legalizing marijuana, we of course need to legalize hemp because it is a critical resource for agriculture, for nutrition, for manufacturing. Henry Ford was making automobiles out of hemp. We need to, and, and I would add for biofuels potentially as well. So uh, this is a very important resource. And again, on day one, what this president would do, if I had the honor of serving, would be to instruct the Food and Drug Administration to actually use science in the listing of drugs and deciding whether or not they are scheduled drugs because if science is used, marijuana and hemp will not be listed or scheduled substances, period. Uh, agree um, uh, on, on the issue of, of indefinite detentions, I think you, you raised, Rose, did you, Rose, did you raise that in passing about how would you fight that? Right, and yeah. putting people in prison without charge. Yes, exactly. That the, the part of this violation of our civil liberties being codified under President Obama, uh, he, he now, and all future presidents now, have the power to basically uh, throw you in jail without ever accusing you of a crime no. or trying you before a jury uh, simply because the president uh, doesn't like what you're doing and thinks that you're an enemy of the state and is not obliged to defend that. So, you know. Like in the words of um, Martin Niemöller, uh, the famous uh, Protestant minister who was imprisoned in uh, Nazi war camps, uh, you know, in his words, first they came for the communists, but I was not a communist, so I said nothing. Then they came for the gypsies, but I wasn't a gypsy, so I didn't say anything. Then they came for the homosexuals, I wasn't a homosexual, etc. And then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak. So, you know, and he in fact was jailed under the Nazis, although he lived to tell the tale. 
But um, you know, it, it does underscore why we cannot take the abuses of our civil liberties for granted. And I would raise that also with your friends and colleagues who are hand-wringing about, oh, do we dare risk the Supreme Court appointments by actually standing up for what we need in this election now and sending a real message that we need to take our democracy back. We haven't touched on immigration, and this is really important, especially because more people have been deported under Obama than Bush. What is your immigration policy? What would you do in regard to amnesty, employer sanctions, family reunification, and guest worker programs? We need to call a halt to this president's policies, misnamed secure communities. It's basically a deportation and racial profiling program. It is currently optional for communities to adopt if they want it, but it's going to be mandatory in 2014 as decided by this White House administration. So this is another reason why people need to step up to the plate and actually start voting their values instead of allowing both the Democratic and Republican parties to slide uh, into demagoguery around immigration. Um, and I would add that uh, we are all immigrants on this bus, with a few exceptions. The Native Americans, who were the original settlers, and then the African American slaves, who didn't have much choice about coming here. But with, with those exceptions, the rest of us are all immigrants, so we need to begin respecting, uh, valuing, and, and appreciating the immigrant members who diversify and enrich our communities and our economy. Uh, and we need to create a welcoming legal path to citizenship, period. Yeah. We also need to go back to the source of the immigration, quote, problem. When you have large migrations of people who've been forced to flee their communities because they've been put out of business, that is a problem, and the source of that problem is called NAFTA. Yeah. Negotiate NAFTA like the Colombia Trade Agreement and ensure that we have fair trade agreements, not free for corporation trade agreements. And, and speaking of Native Americans, the UN just finished a two week fact finding trip to Indian reservations and concluded that the US government should give back stolen land. Yeah. All right, so why don't you each take three minutes to give a closing statement and maybe you can include some comments about how to really broaden this space. And just one comment from another audience member, uh, the non-adversarial way the two of you have interacted with each other and the cooperation you have demonstrated makes me proud to be a Green. Please talk about how this can move the country forward. And it's a wonderful campaign within the Green Party where the candidates uh, really collaborate, uh, as Roseanne and I are here today, we're really modeling what our political system ought to look like, and including that these are all the women. And, you know, I think one of the ways, well, it seems to me the biggest way that we uh, actually enlarge the party and enlarge this campaign uh, is by paying attention uh, to a famous quote, which was that the biggest way people give up power is by not knowing they have it to start with. That was Alice Walker who said that. And I think there are so many people out there right now who are really hurting for what we have to offer on stopping home foreclosures, on providing health care as a human right, on providing employment as a human economic right so that everyone has a job, a living wage, community-based job that makes our communities healthier, uh, stopping the wars and, and bringing our war budget home. Uh, you know, this is a win-win for the American people. A lot of people have been afraid to stand up and vote for it, afraid to stand up as Greens, afraid to actually break away from the establishment parties, and that didn't happen by coincidence. You know, this has been the product of a fear campaign that has been just drumbeat, uh, drummed into the American public, certainly for the past decade, intensively since the 2000 election, but even before then. And I think it's a really incredible opportunity right now to 
point people to the record and what has come of this politics of fear, this feeling that you gotta vote for the lesser evil or something terrible will happen. We've seen after 10 years where people bought into that lock, stock, and barrel that silence is not an effective political strategy. Survive, survive. that the politics of fear, in fact, has brought us everything that we were afraid of and to be quiet in order to avoid. We've gotten it in spades. So I think how we make the party, in fact, bigger is by number one, reaching out to your contacts, your networks, get on Facebook, get on the internet, get the word out, let's go viral. I would encourage you to go to my website uh, JillStein.org. If you sign up to be a volunteer, you'll get the newsletter. The newsletter is substantive. It's about the issues. It's about Bradley Manning. It's about jobs. Uh, it's about uh, the ending the drone warfare. You know, it's it's the stuff that people are concerned about and talking about. You can use that letter to get the word out. Uh, you know, I think this. Race is just a staggering opportunity to turn a breaking point into a tipping point yeah. and to take back our democracy <laughs> and the peaceful, just, green future we deserve. So let's make it happen and let's do it together. I urge you to go to my website uh, and we can be a powerful, unstoppable force together. Thank you. Uh, and then the Green Party will choose its nominee at its July 12th convention in Baltimore. Thank you, Rose.
No, but you said the my wife and the other one. Yeah. Like the one I was But he was telling me how he's going to vote for Obama. Oh, man. We need to give him the cubby to get religion. So he goes through and he says, I want to vote for somebody who's going to win. I'm gonna give him the line, you know, you want to vote for somebody you don't like and have to win or something. Yeah, that's right, that was a good Everything they were saying about, you know, it's like, no, no difference, you know, no, you know, things are going to get worse, right? Less for number two slime bags, whatever. Anyway, it was good to see you. All right, take care. And come by, you know, we're still there. I might, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of, 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 sort Right back.